So my name is uh, Robert Secord. I, uh, I work for uh, JF Bastion at, uh, at Woven by Toyota, which is our new name is about a month ago. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, I guess. <laughs> I um, started assembly programming uh, professionally in 82, and I've been programming C since 85. Uh, so I've been at it a bit. Um, I'm, uh, I've been involved with C standardization since uh, around 2004, so around 20 years. And uh, I'm uh, currently unopposed to become the next WG14 convener in September. So uh, unless they see this video and decide to reopen the submissions, uh, I'll probably end up becoming the, the C convener. Um, okay, I also added the subtitle in safe, secure, correct code, uh, because it occurred to me that uh, if you didn't care about writing safe, secure code, then signed integers are fine. Just to introduce my biases a little early. Okay, so using strong type defs is a great idea. Uh, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> Any questions at all? <laughs> so, so obviously that's not quite everything, right? I mean, when you implement a strong type, uh, you're going to have to have an underlying representation. And the idea of C++, right, is uh, uh, you get to have these nice abstractions, but uh, it's going to only sort of generate code around sort of the base primitives so that you'll get the performance that you expect. Right, so what that means is, you know, the behavior of the primitive integer type you select is going to get exposed as the, uh, you know, the interface and the behavior of your strong type. So I'm going to start with some just some basics. None of the basic stuff should be controversial. It's just kind of facts. It's just kind of get you into the the mindset. Uh, then I'll talk about signed versus unsigned, uh, which I understand is kind of a running argument at. Uh, these, these meetings, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then, if we have time, I'll uh, talk about exact width types. Uh, mostly there, I'm kind of reacting to some Misra, AutoZar type of rules dealing with uh, safety and, and what, they, uh, what they ask of uh, C++ developers. So uh, C++, and, I, I, and I'm, I am a C guy, I tried to uh, convert this presentation into C++, which uh, it was surprising to me that there was as much difference as there was because I just, it's, I, still, I still feel like integer behavior in C is exactly the same as C++, but the language used to describe it is a little bit different. So there are uh, five standard sign integer types, sign char, short int, int, long int, long, long int. Char is the only one you have to say signed. Uh, because plain char, of course, is implementation defined to be either unsigned char or signed char. Um, for each of the sign types, there's a corresponding but different uh, unsigned integer type. So signed integers um, uh, are able to represent positive and negative values. That's really where, uh, where the, the worth comes from. Uh, and the range, of course, depends on the number of bits allocated and the representation. Uh, it, it wasn't too long ago that signed integers could be represented by two's complement, one's complement, or signed in magnitude. Uh, more recently, uh, that's been restricted to uh, two's complement. So each sign, unsigned integer type has a corresponding sign type that occupies the same amount of storage. So that's, that's a nice thing to have. You know, when you read through the standard and you look for guarantees, there are, very, there are really very, very few guarantees that are made. So the fact that there's a guarantee here that the corresponding signed and unsigned types uh, you take them as a mass storage, I mean, that's great. Something you can actually depend upon, so uh, it's always nice to know. Um, so all sufficiently uh, small non-negative values have the same representation in the signed and unsigned types. The sign bit's the highest order bit and indicates whether the value's uh, negative. Uh, so as I was saying, up through C17, which is the current C standard, we're, um, we're, currently, in, we're currently in comments for C23, so C23 hopefully will be out later this year. Um, so up through C17, C++17, 
Negative values can be represented as sine and magnitude one's complement and two's complement. And there may be, you know, every once in a while I see a paper arguing that one's complement is better. And uh, it's, not, it's not a horrible argument, right? I mean, there is, there is some basis for arguing it's better, but it's, it's uh, sort of becoming a thing of the past now. Uh, and with uh, um, starting with C23 and C20, uh, only two's complement is supported. So two's complement, um, you know, the goal is to define the standard in mathematical terms, not in terms of hardware. Uh, so the way it's defined is that the sine bit is given the weight uh, negative two to the n minus one, and all the other values, uh, all the other bits have the same weight as for unsigned, right? So you, you, you just add up uh, all, the, uh, all the bits, and then you subtract uh, the sign bit if it's set, and that gives you uh, the value that's being represented. So for example, uh, this string of bits equals negative uh, 43 uh, in two's complement representation. So given that we've got a 10-bit uh, integer there, which is unusual but not prohibited, <laughs> Um, uh, the sign bit it has the weight of uh, minus 512. Uh, you add up all the, the sign value, which is 469, and you get this uh, value, negative 43. So to negate this from more of a hardware pers perspective, you just take the ones complement, which is you flip all the bits and, and add one with carry, right? So, so this shows here uh, the way you form a twos complement. So uh, here are two complement values for um, an 8-bit um, uh, signed integer type. So you see, you know, zeros, all zeros. Uh, one has the uh, low order bit set. And then, you know, if this bit set, then you've got two to the first or two. Uh, eventually, if you have all bits set except the sign bit, you've got S char max, the largest value that can be represented as a 8-bit uh, signed char. Uh, if you increment again, you basically overflow. Uh, and overflows typically implement as wraparound, so you would wrap around to the minimum value that can be represented in the type. And that's true of all uh, assigned integer types. And eventually, as you continue to increment, you become increasingly less negative until you get to all bit set, which is uh, minus one. OK, so again, this is just kind of review to get you uh, ready for the rest of the discussion. So unsigned integer types uh, represent values a pure binary system, right? Most bit has two zeros, next bit has two to the one, and so forth. And the value is the sum of all the bit set. Um, and so the values range from zero to a max that depends on the, the width of the type. So that can be calculated as two to the n minus one, uh, where n is the width. So all bitwise operators treat um, these values uh, using a pure binary model. So if I have the number 13 and I XOR it with six, uh, you just XOR each uh, combination. So one and zero is one, one and one is zero, zero and one is one, one and zero is one, and the result is 11. So it's just pure binary uh, calculation. Okay, so here's a slide. Uh, I didn't show this slide to, to a gentleman yesterday, but I, I got in a fight with him over the content of the slide, which, um, I hadn't adequately anticipated that this would be that controversial, <laughs> uh, especially since it's mostly just uh, it's just mostly just definitional. Um, okay. So the definition of overflow, and this is taken from the ISO glossary. So it's good in standards if you can draw from a kind of common definitions. So that you know, C and C++ and Fortran and COBOL all uh, have the same definition of this term. So it says a portion of a numeric word expressing the result of an arithmetic operation by which its word length exceeds the word length provided for the number representation. So that may may not be exactly how I would have defined it, but uh, you know, it's it's a usable definition for C and C++. So I think we both use it. I know C doesn't define this term separately. We, we normatively reference it. I think C++ does the same. OK, so wraparound um, is the process by which a value is reduced modulo 2 to the n, where n is the width of the resulting type. 
That definition I had to add to the C standard. It wasn't there up until about six months ago. Uh, so in fact, um, this next point was the bit that we couldn't quite agree on, which is really do, um, do can unsigned integers overflow? Uh, and so when I, when I first asked this question in the C committee, no one had a response. Uh, so C++ sort of had a response, which is uh, no, they can. Only signed integers can overflow. So uh, about six months ago, I wrote a paper clarifying integer terms. That got adopted. That'll be part of C23. And now, uh, you know, it's a little bit closer to the C++ definitions. So, uh, so in terms of, you know, standard ease, uh, only signed integer operations can overflow. And, and the way, um, you know, the way the, way the committees accomplish this, they kind of lawyered, lawyered it, right? So what they did was they said, if you uh, unsigned computations are calculated modulo, right? So basically, you perform the modulo op operation, and then you try to fit it into the number of bits you have. And if you wait until after you, you, you uh, form the modulo value, then it's always going to fit, right? So now it doesn't overflow. Uh, so that's how um, that's how the committees pull that off. Any questions? See, no yelling, no screaming, very civil. <laughs> um, okay, so this bit is kind of interesting. I didn't really um, the, the the next few slides are something I added after Issaquah after talking to some people there. Uh, so. Uh, in fact, this is something that I sort of learned that I didn't quite realize before. And, and when we get to the, you know, let's argue about signed versus unsigned, this will come up a little bit. Uh, so looking at optimizations, uh, here we've got a signed value, signed int, and unsigned int, and I give them both a, a large value. Okay. So then we've got a, a printf here, and we're just going to take this large value and multiply it by seven and divide by seven. Uh, and so it's pretty obvious that that's not gonna be representable, right? And so we've got, uh, we do it with signed and we do it with unsigned. And so what I, what I would say about this is both of these, both of these expressions are incorrect. They're kind of wrong, but they're wrong in kind of different ways, okay? so. So this first one is wrong in that it has undefined behavior, right? And generally speaking, because it has signed integer overflow, and signed integer overflow is undefined behavior. So generally speaking, um, you know, that's bad, right? Most people um, all kind of agree that undefined behavior is bad, except people who argue for signed integer types, who in that one area think it's good which is, you know, really nonsensical argument. <laughs> uh, I don't know where the signed integer people are going to show up, but, uh, you know, when you feel like you've been insulted enough, you can, you can start to, you know, attack back or something. Um, so for this other expression, uh, we have unsigned. So now, this statement is perfectly correct in terms of the language definition, right? This is well defined to wrap around. Uh, but the reason I said they're both wrong is that it's pretty obvious to everyone in the room that this is going to simplify to one, and one times any value is just the value, right? So these can be uh, reduced to just the value, right? So it's stupid to have this extra logic there that's unnecessary. So they're both kind of wrong, uh, but you know, in my opinion, uh, the signed one's more wrong <laughs> because it introduces undefined behavior, whereas this is at least correct in terms of the, the language definition, both C and C++. Okay, so the results are for the signed uh, in an optimized build, you get the correct result. And for the unsigned, you get, well, let me, yeah, you get the correct result but you get the mathematically incorrect result, okay? So this is not the mathematical result. Uh, and so that could be a little surprising to folks. 
So what's going on here exactly? Um, so the signed operation can be optimized because of the undefined behavior, right? So basically, and, and in this case, it produces the correct result, right? So, um, so basically, the, the compiler says, you know, this code is all broken, I can ignore it. Um, and then you wind up with the right result. When we do this with unsigned, so this is generally incorrect. The compiler is actually allowed to say this code will never be called. Um, this is undefined behavior. Undefined behavior never happens in the program. The compiler is allowed to, to reason back as far as necessary to come to the conclusion that this code can never be called. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is a particular implementation, right? This is what actually happens on a platform, which I think was Visual Studio. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the undefined behavior bit of this is the overflow. So in the presence of overflow, this code can do anything, right? And if it doesn't overflow, <coughs> then you're required to get a correct, a correct result. So yeah, I agree. Um, so for unsigned, the, the, the thing is that uh, that code is, you know, there's no error in it, right? It's well defined. So the compiler is required to produce the result uh, that you programmed, that you asked for, right? And so what you asked for was, um, you know, multiply this large number by seven, which is going to wrap around and then do this division and get this uh, mathematically incorrect looking result. And there's quite a bit more code to do it. Uh, so, so this, you know, these slides here argue a little bit against what my overall thesis is. Uh, but the, you know, the, the initial point here is that, you know, both of these things are wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, the problem with this unsigned one is um, you know, you're getting exactly what you asked for, but uh, you probably wanted to ask for something else, right? You probably want to make sure that uh, the result of this operation, this multiplication operation, did not wrap around. Okay. Um, so, uh, there's a type called size t. How many people have heard of size t? You have. You're just, you're nodding. Okay, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> so size t is the unsigned intertype of the result of the size of operator. So when you call size of, you get a size t, right? That's just going to happen. A lot of things return size t. So uh, size t are guaranteed, guaranteed to have sufficient precision to represent the size of any object that can be allocated on your system. Um, it's also guaranteed to be an unsigned integer type. So the limit of size t, the upper limit, is specified by size, uh, size max macro. Um, and the lower limit, of course, is zero. So KNR didn't provide this. And uh, for that reason, uh, 40 years later, some people like, aren't aware of it. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it, it was part of C89. And it was introduced in C89 to eliminate a portability problem because unsigned int might be too small to represent, you know, say a 64-bit address space, and unsigned long long might be too large and consequently inefficient to represent a size on a 32-bit address space. So, so notice in this discussion, right, no one anywhere in here suggested using an int to represent a size, okay? So int, um, you know, int is not even wrong. You know, it's so far off the, the realm of possibility, right? If you use unsigned int, you would be wrong. You know, int isn't even that close to being correct. It's not, it's not even good enough to be wrong. You see, see, we're like in a physics lab, and there's a famous physicist, and uh, that's how he would review papers. He'd say, this is not even wrong. Your paper is so horrible. 
Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the previous thing. We had sine times 7 divided by 7 and then sine times 7 divided by 7. Okay. So it seems that the compiler can assume that there's not going to be any overflow with the sine one and just optimize the times 7 divided by 7 out of existence. Yes. Whereas the same expression with unsigned is not allowed to do that. So does that mean that um, in the general case we don't have to be sine is going to be measurably faster? It will be. Like right, so the same equation, just replace unsigned by sine is going to run faster. Yeah, but you have to you, you have to understand what you're saying, right? Yeah. Oh, good. That's not what happens. The difference is that because the first one, because the unsigned one can't, it has to be done by modulo. Therefore, the result of ui1 times 7 divided by 7 is not the same as ui1 times mm. 7 divided by 7. So if you were to put braces around 7 times 7, you would get different behavior. But it, it can, in, in the first one, because the result is exactly the same, because it can't overflow, it can do the 7 by 7, see it's 1, and then just say times 1. But, but it could be conceivable if you have a, a, some kind of equation where you don't care if it's signed or unsigned. No, it's not going to overflow with the sign. And you split it from sign to unsigned, and it's going to run slower. Yeah. You get to run well, so, 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 so yeah. No, no, you know that no, it's no, not. You know it's not. You know it's not by construction. Your right. your integers are small enough that you know that it's, it'll never yeah. overflow. Yeah. So I actually have that, that that exact example in my book. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I just looked that up because it seems like this would happen. Yeah, it, it, it happens. I have that yeah. exact example. Okay, cool. I mean, not not on this context, but same thing. Yeah, yeah, game yeah. versus sign and sign. Yeah. See, see, I, I was see. My view is that, uh, you know, that code is, you know, defective. It has undefined behavior, right? And so the compiler can do whatever it wants, and it does something, right? So basically, the reason it runs faster is because the compiler is ignoring the broken code. Right? So if you don't run all the code, yeah, it can be faster, right? But well, well it can be more than ignored. It can assume that undefined behavior will not happen. Right. It can assume that you'll never give it a value that will overflow because right. if it does, that's undefined. And says, yes. I so, will assume that undefined behavior will not happen. So yes. in the presence of there being no undefined behavior, this is what I will do, and that's what it will do for all of that. And, yeah. and it's faster. So if, if the value, if SI one wasn't a constant assigned here, it was a function parameter. Then, and these two lines print f were like in the body of the function. The body of the function was assigned in would have been faster. And you would be responsible for not calling it uh, with a large enough in that it overflows. So you have more narrow preconditions, but then the trade off is that you get better optimization. Yes, and the optimization is precisely because the compiler will assume that it never overflows, it will never generate the overflowing code path. So it will cancel 7 divided by 7. Uh, and it will just generate, you know, print that. Whereas the other one, the compiler will assume that it overflows, and you want to handle it correctly because if you did, you would have called it signed. If you didn't want to handle it, correctly. right, right, it does. So you're asking to handle it correctly. Then right, it will handle it. Correctly. Right, but but listen, listen to what you said. Right, in the unsigned case, the compiler does what you tell it to do. Okay, in the signed case, it does something else. <laughs> Other than what you told it to no, do. No, that's exactly what, what I told it to do. I told I told it a it will never overflow, and b uh, do do that separation. It does exactly what I told it to do. You let it assume it wouldn't overflow. It doesn't. You know. So for example, if you have a non-optimizing compiler, right? It's it's uh, it's a valid implementation standard, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, a compiler doesn't have to optimize. It doesn't have to optimize, but. As long as it doesn't overflow, it still has to produce that result. So the result will be correct if it doesn't overflow, and the compiler may generate better code because I told it that it won't overflow by labeling it signed instead of unsigned. Right. I told it it won't overflow. So, so in this case, I'll get a different result from uh, O0. Um, no, you'll get the same result. If it doesn't overflow, you'll get the same result. If it does overflow. If it, oh, if it does overflow. Uh, Unoptimized. Sorry, you're, you're, you're out of contract. Yeah, you don't care about if, that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't care what happens if it's overflow. You call the program out of contract, I, I, I'm not promising you anything. Wait a second. And so that's why, but that's why it's important to understand that because failure is this. On my function, there's a big comment which says, don't call this out of contract. And the contract is less than one seventh of int max. And if you call it, your shoes will burst on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do it. it but that's, but that's, 
that's kind of maybe a subtle difference that yeah. because that by you saying it is signed, the compiler says by you telling me it's signed, I know that you will never overflow an operation with an int. So I can do anything I want, assuming that that will be true. Because the compiler says, I will assume that undefined behavior will not happen anywhere in your program. That's yeah. why sometimes you'll get unexpected results from these because they could, it assumes. Right, right, let me, let me rephrase that, right? So when you use a sign type, basically, you're writing a check that your ass can't cash, right? You're saying, I promise you, like these values will always be exactly, but it's, 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 it's just like what you call somewhere function. up at the top of my program. I yeah, have yeah. An assert a condition that says if it's too large. Wait, don't you have a, you have an assert or so, a condition. So maybe you I, know that you're testing code. during. Maybe okay, so you're adding code. now a test, and now with the addition of this test, your code's going to run faster. Yes, with the undefined behavior and this branching the test. Top, yes, because up at the top I have this one test which says go this way and go this way, and inside of this. I call it a million times, and I know that I didn't change the value, so it will do the, okay. the condition is still. I'm, I'm going to say one last thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move to this gentleman's question. Okay, The last thing I'm going to say is uh, you cannot put this code on a safety critical system, right? Because uh, we had to follow MISRA. MISRA says no UB. Mm -hmm. This code has UB. This will not pass. This cannot be put on a safety qualified vehicle. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I would like to, for the, I know, but since we came back to that slide. So your first comment was that the compiler was allowed to just eliminate the first print F because it's int max, so if you multiply by seven, it overflows, so it might just say, no, it's not going to, uh, in that particular case. Correct. So, uh, Was so that not the but, 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 is a volatile S argument. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, no. but what if one at the time uh, it executes the expression, the multiplication, maybe because it's volatile, it's it still might still have changed the value. Yeah. 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 Is, is it correct or not? You, you, you're not guaranteed to read the same value back that you wrote to a volatile. Exactly. So the comp my point is mm -hmm. the compiler is not allowed to eliminate it. Yeah, it, well, it depends printing. on the scoping of that, uh, that volatile and uh, double Right, if it's a if it's a volatile int in a in a uh, in a code block that has no access externally, the compiler can reason. No, his no point is that the volatile can change without you seeing it. Yeah, and, and it can. If somebody has, if you have, yeah. Well, no, that's that's yeah, that's exactly true because you could have it. It represents some some hardware yep. component. Yeah. So yeah, so volatile. Yeah, I, I don't know what the rules are with respect to volatile and UB. That's like my question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the rules are with respect to volatile. Without volatile, I know exactly what the rules are for this. But I, I agree with you. If the, oh, it's still UB volatile. to actually hit it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Volatile doesn't remove any UB. No, but it's, it's UB if it actually happens. But what if, if if you get to that point and it's no longer in max? What if it's zero? Like what? Defined. Which means the compiler still has to go through the motions and generate at least the read, and only if the read returns into max, then the compiler is allowed to say, okay, everything goes to hell. Well, the compiler still is allowed to assume that the read will never give you a value internally. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Still it, oh, so, the time, oh, still so, the time. so the compiler is allowed to assume that it max will not survive. But. <laughs> okay. And by, and by, I completely agree. If we remove the volatile, then the compiler is allowed to remove the first print F. Well, it's allowed to remove everything. I, I don't think, Andrew, okay, exactly everything. I don't think that's what's happening. I, I think the point is that if you overflow, then the difference whether you multiply by seven and then divide by seven is different to you multiplying by seven divided by seven. I think that's what's happening. No, if you overflow, so it, really if you overflow, seven doesn't come into it. If you overflow, the compiler is allowed to say, you're on seven, I meant 11, or whatever. The seven doesn't enter into it if you overflow. It's UB. At this point, the compiler can do whatever it wants. Oh, yeah, of course. But I, I think what, what we're seeing, like, it can do whatever it wants, but I think what it does... What it actually did here, it basically ignored 7s completely, yeah. It, it, okay. It, it, it did 7 divided by 7. It, so yeah, it, 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 it reordered re 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 the But it, the other one, it, no, it couldn't do that. It optimized the way it reordered it. it, it I, think I'm gonna, I think I'm going to try to end the discussion here. I think that was pretty good, and we got the gist of it. Yeah. Kind of unrelated comment. 
Good. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think the slide also shows that the unsigned int design is uh, kind of broken because multiplication happens modulo two times n, but division happens uh, not by modulo. If uh, the operations were both done using modulo, the result would be uh, like equal to that. No, they're both done modulo. It's just the yeah. the division is less than. Yeah. Like, yeah. How would you know how many modulus you have after, <laughs> after you've already <laughs> dropped them? <laughs> Seven is uh, comprised with uh, two times two to, po to the power of n. So if the division was done by modulo arithmetic, the output would be the same. No. no. It just yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, I think it's a like real it's mathematical it's integral exactly. modulus division. That's the point. That's the yeah. Point. Yeah, that's the point, yeah. was done. Well, but that's a hard. Then, then you cannot learn in a mathematical you know, model. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's structured. It's done one at the time. Just the multiplication is done in this mathematical structure model which you n, but division is not. This will array the rest. Well, the division is done what's not what's on what's left. Division is done on the result of the multiplication. Yes. Yes, but. Yes, so you using another mathematical. So you have a mathematical structure that is a, a, a ring, right? Yeah, the ring and the and ring. You would have the third so the slash seven z. Yeah, and it does the multiplication of that yeah. ring, and, and then and, that and, result and, 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 it keeps, and it keeps not just the result but the entire relation. No, no, the, the, and then no. takes the result of that multiplication that ring, and now I take this value, and now I forget that is in z slash seven z. And now I do that division in Z. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So it yes. changed mathematically out of the blue. It changed the, where the the yeah, yes. Z number yeah. lives. Yes. If you, if you can uh, if, if you get both components, then it would know. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I love this so far. This is great. This is why I didn't think we'd get to the second topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I was talking about size T. Um, yeah, I think I got all the way through this, right? So, so, oh, the last thing I want to say about this is, uh, and I'll, I'll have some slides on this coming up. People are going to say, you know, it, there was an accident and uh, uh, size, size T was defined as an unsigned type, right? And my comment here is that, no, there was no accident, okay? <laughs> this was the work of, you know, the, the ANCC committee and uh, Dennis Ritchie, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of really smart people, okay, who, you know, know what the fuck they were talking about, <laughs> right? So for whatever, you know, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, right, this was not like, like an accident. No one tripped and fell and, you know, <laughs> there was a spill and it turned into an unsigned number. Um, okay, so use cases. Uh, size t again is a portable and efficient way to declare a variable that contains a size. Uh, so if you're gonna if you're gonna take the size of something, you'll want to restore store the result of that into a value of type size t. Uh, if you're uh, calling a function that takes a size argument, you would declare that parameter as being uh, type size t. You know if you're pass if you're creating a function that takes a string, you'd have a pointed char and a size t to indicate the length of the string. Um, it's also useful to, uh, for index variables that go from zero to the, uh, to the size of an object. Um, uh, maybe C++ has a special type for that. You guys, like, are super fancy. Uh, C, we just have, you know, a few things we can afford. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So this slide here, uh, I just wanted to highlight the fact that C++ has a, uh, make signed and a make unsigned. And so the idea here is you can take uh, any type that's signed and create an unsigned version of it or any unsigned type and make a signed version of it. Uh, so that's the only reason this is here. So that sort of suggests the existence of S size T, which is a uh, assigned uh, size type. Now, assigned size type is defined by POSIX. And it's used for functions whose return value could either be a valid size or a negative value to indicate an error, right? So it has to be a sign type. And the requirement in POSIX is that 
um, it can store values in the range of minus 1 to size max, right? So the only requirement in POSIX is that you can represent this one negative value, minus 1 indicate an error, right? So the um, calling make sign with a size t type gives you a type which meets the POSIX requirement, basically exceeds the POSIX requirement, right? You don't need all these other unsigned values but it meets the minimum requirements established by POSIX. Okay, so the, the, the thing about this S size T type is it's basically an abomination against God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, so the first problem is, you know, the use that's described here in POSIX, the justification for this type is for uh, in-band errors, right? And Anyone in C++, anyone here think in-band errors are a good idea? OK. Can no you, one. Can yeah? In-band in -band means that the function or method returns a value. And some, some representable value isn't actually a value. It's an error indicator. Does that exclude monads? I don't know. <laughs> You used the C++ word on me. <laughs> I, I, I would say, you know, like an example of an inbound error indicator, which I don't think is awful, is null, right? So if you return a no pointer, that's typically an error indicator, but it's in the same position as the value. And we sort of let that one go because there's so much language support for it. So, you know, uh, I was expecting one of you people, because you're very bright, very argumentative, to <laughs> bring up no values. And I would say, yeah, that's, that's OK by me. Yeah, yeah. Expected. Expected, yeah. Expected, yeah. You said an option which is specifically for you either have a value or you have a value. Yeah, so we, we all pretty much agree, right? This is a poor use case. But that's, what, that's how this type got in, right? It didn't get in here because POSIX thought, you know, sizes should be signed, right? My point so far is nobody ever thought that, <laughs> right? Until somewhat recently in C++. So, and I'll talk about that. Uh, quick question on the last slide. Yeah. So was that added in 2017? Is that with the POSIX one? I... I don't know when it was added. I just uh, looked at the latest version and found it there. Uh, I'm very strongly confident it's been there much longer. I know that uh, there was a C11 paper that got published as a TR. So prior to C11, back in 2008, 2009, that had the size T type in it. So obviously been around longer than that. OK, so we're going to get on to the controversial part of the talk. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to start with a poll question, right? So, so let me show you all the answers. Uh, so, so the first answer is, do you only use unsigned integers for modulo behavior? Second, and this gentleman will say it doesn't work for modulo behavior. The second question is, do you only use unsigned integers uh, to represent values that cannot be negative? And the third answer is, I'm only here for the snacks. You know, have a struggle. Kid. <laughs> now, even given all these three answers, we won't get all the hands raised. But let's let's try it out. So, number one, only for modulo behavior. How many people believe that? Uh, clarify. You mean I only use it when I want modular arithmetic, or I use yeah. only unsigned when I expect modular arithmetic? Which way? I only use unsigned integers when I want to have modular behavior. That's the only use case for oh, unsigned okay. integers is to get modular behavior. There's no, under, no other possible reason <laughs> to use an unsigned integer. Okay. Okay, anyone for that one? Zero people. Wow. Okay, so I think I can wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that was my argument. So, so uh, okay, how many people think you use only use unsigned integers to represent values that can't be negative. Pretty much, okay, here for the snacks? <laughs> yeah, I, I should have known. Okay, so. What's that? No, no, they are both for me. Okay. Sometimes I use for models, sometimes I use for no negative numbers. 
So it's not only use one case or only use the other case. I use both cases. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, I kind of think the second one includes the first one, kind of. Okay, yeah, that's how I interpret it. Yeah. So, okay. okay. I so non-negative numbers, and if it happens to overflow, it's still non-negative. That's a so that's a pretty good result. Um, I've and asked a few audiences this, and you know, mostly engineers, and it's usually about a thirty to one ratio. You know. Um, where 30 people say only for values that can't be negative and one person will say uh, only for module behavior. And I feel like that one person, I haven't talked to them, in the future I will, I'm like, did you get that from the C++ standards committee? Is that where you learned that? Because <laughs> I think that's where that's coming from. I mean, the engineers I speak to, um, you know, are pretty consistent on this. And you guys are too. Um, okay, so I'm going to go into a use case, and this is the, you know, there's a bunch of use cases and not enough time to do all of them, but this is the one that I think comes up the most frequently in this argument. So it's loop limited by lower bound. So an unsigned integer expression can never evaluate to less than zero because of wraparound. Uh, so it's possible to, uh, to code tests that are always true or false. So because uh, in this example, because I can't take on a negative value, uh, this is an infinite loop. Um, now, um, we've, we've seen this kind of before, right? Um, in terms of the language definition, this code is perfectly correct. There's no, there's nothing you could point out there and say there's a defect, right? Well, there is. If that loop has no side effects, then it's QB again. Let's assume it does something. I mean, uh, I, I just put the <laughs> first line. <laughs> um, yeah, so it could be, uh, you know, it could be done intentionally, right? Now, now most of the time, uh, most of the time, this is a mistake, and and this is kind of the, this is going to lead into the sign integer argument, right? That uh, programmers, you know, naive programmers might make this kind of mistake. Okay, uh, so I've said all that, I believe. So can we make that loop better by using a signed integer type? So here uh, we use s size t, and I'm going to uh, cast size minus 1 to the, the sign type. So the first thing you can say about this loop is it's definitely going to terminate, right? I mean, um, we've got this. Uh, we've got this value, this size value, uh, which uh, say it's 10, then we'll have you know, 9 here. Uh, we'll increment, decrement that value of i uh, each loop until uh, while it's greater than or equal to 0. So when it gets to uh, less than 0, the loop is going to terminate. So we, we, we have guaranteed termination. Now, um, the thing that signed integer proponents would say is uh, signed integers have nice normal behavior around zero, right? So I can have an index that turns into a zero, turns into a negative number, and nothing bad happens, right? Uh, signed integers have that range. All that behavior around zero is very well defined, and zero is a common number, right? So it's common to have integer values, uh, you know, around to either side of zero. But there is, a, there is an unsigned to sign type conversion in this code. And this is some place, this is a place where C and C++ are actually different. So in C, an unsigned to sign type conversion can result in an implementation defined signal uh, and some other bad things. Uh, C++ uh, doesn't allow for that. But Certainly, uh, not all the values of the original type can be represented the resulting type. So if you had a value for size that could not be represented as a S size t, it would be converted to a negative sign value, which would cause the loop to terminate immediately. Right? So basically, this loop is, is broken. Yeah? So if that's the size coming from an actual container, then you would need to be able to take the difference from the last and the first. And store that in a footer diff feed. Yep. So wouldn't that kind of like never be possible to produce an invalid value as long as the size t was actually the size of the structure? 
I think, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll give an answer and then we'll <coughs> argue about it. So my first answer is, um, according to the standard, when you subtract um, two pointers from each other, the result is a pointer diff t, and the value may not be representable and might be undefined behavior. So that's what the standard says. So it can be undefined? Yeah. And uh, because, again, you could have a, a large character array uh, that was greater you know, than, uh, s s what's the <laughs> int, int max? Right, is greater than the signed value can represent. Uh, and I, I gave this slide, this presentation to Google back in 2005, and they got so angry at me. And, I, and I'm just trying to explain this. It's just like the way the language is defined. I didn't come up with that. But you know, in the C committee, when we discussed it, <laughs> they'll, they, they sort of say the worst possible thing, which is they'll say, um, it works almost all the time, <laughs> which, from a safety and security perspective, is the worst thing you can hear, right? Because it means this will get through testing just fine, and you're not going to find this until, you know, 100 people die in, you know, horrible, horrible fashion. Does that mean I can't, in a safety critical way, take the difference between the address of two elements of an head? It can definitely be larger than, than low. I, I, well, sure. I, was, I thought that. The size of the structure had to, you had to be able to take a difference. But, uh, but you problem. can't store it in a long. I mean, if you know which one is greater, you can store it in an unsigned long. Or right, key. right. So, so when you take the difference, right, the unsigned conversion will be accurate. But what happens then is you have, you have now have the magnitude, but you lose sort of the vector. You lose the direction. So that's one of the reasons it usually works is because usually people treat that as a unsigned uh, magnitude only. But if you're relying on the direction and the magnitude, then your code could fail. OK. Um, so I said that. I just went back. Now, I don't know if you can allocate that much in one show. That's, that's the question. The question is, how much storage can you really get? And that feels to be implementation defined, right? It's based on so the as system. As long as pointers and longs are of the same size, the answer works out to no. Well, so. so the size of long, it's just what the spec says. If the spec says you have to be able to take the difference, then yeah. it's safe. If the spec doesn't say you have to be able to so take the difference, if you, if you have a 64 bit size T, um, something, something here changed. So when I get to the end of this, my information might be dated. But when you have a 64-bit size T, um, you've got 64-bit pointer diff T, but it's signed, which means you don't have quite the same range. Yeah, which means it's half, the max is half roughly. Right, right. One. So there are values that can't be represented. Yes. With a 32-bit with a size T, um, you have a um, uh, 16-pointer diff T. Well, it doesn't have to be, I mean, whatever the, what the platform defines on 32-bit, like on x86, 32-bit, they were both 32-bit. Yeah. So. I, it used to be that only the only the sort of 16-bit um, architecture was the only case where you were required to always be able to represent uh, the pointer diff t. So it was required to be uh, basically a larger size. Uh, so that used to be the case. It was a little tweak in the the last version of the C standard, where they changed something from 16 to 17 bits to 17 to 16. I have to go back and look, but um, I don't know. Did, did we actually like say that the mandatory architectures don't exist in the in the standard when we did the cleanup? Okay. Well, uh, so, someone take that as a homework. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll circle back on that one in the channel. Um, Okay, so here's another approach, right? So another approach is, why don't we use unsigned integers uh, with wraparound? So we could initialize i to size minus i and decrement on each operation. 
Uh, when the counter reaches zero, the decrement case will cause the, the wraparound, uh, the counter to wrap around to the maximum possible value, size max. And so now that the value of i uh, is larger than size, um, this termination condition of i being less than size will be evaluated to false, and the loop will terminate. And this is guaranteed to work because unsigned wraparound is well-defined behavior, right? The compiler has to uh, generate that code. Now, the problem with this solution is that, uh, okay, so wraparound is well-defined behavior in these two languages. The problem is um, most of the time, even though wraparound is well-defined, most of the time it's wrong. It's incorrect behavior. Right? So there are algorithms, uh, encryption algorithms, for example, where modulo behavior is part of the algorithm. It's expected, it's desired, there's nothing wrong with it, right? But if you have, if you're Bill Gates, Bill Gates is not like the rich guy anymore. Is it uh, Bezos or is it Elon? I don't know how much Elon's, Elon's worth on any right given now. day. Depends what he's tweeting. <laughs> uh, so say you're Bezos, right? And you have $4 billion in the bank and you put a dollar in, and now you have zero dollars in the bank, right? <laughs> yeah. your, your view of that is, is gonna be a, there's a mistake here, right? Some kind of error occurred. <laughs> um, so, so I'm arguing that, um, you know, sizes should be unsigned, and a result of that is, you know, unsigned integer wraparound becomes dangerous, because it's pretty easy, for example, in the case of a calic type of thing where you multiply two, you know, size by number of elements, you get a wraparound, you end up allocating too little storage and end up with a buffer overflow. So unsigned wraparound is something you want to detect and sort of eliminate from your code in most cases, right? Um, and so there are tools to do that. And one is uh, the sanitize flag, F sanitize unsigned integer overflow. And, you know, I think I think that's good practice to uh, turn that on. I mean, I'm not going to argue whether it should be uh, only during development and turned off at deployment or you know, either way, but even if you just have it on during development and test, right? if your loop is <laughs> designed to wrap around, you're not gonna be able to get through your test. Right? It's always gonna trigger this false positive, if you will. Um, so <laughs> the final solution is the do while loop uh, that tests the condition at the end of the loop, right? So here, I'm using size, size types. Um, I never wrap around. I always terminate. Um, I can't find a problem with this code. People might think it's ugly, but... You could always execute it once, right? Whereas the, the while loop may execute zero times. Yeah, it can't not execute once. So size could be zero. Hint of size starts at zero, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a <laughs> fair point. I still don't hate it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. You could always throw in your hint of size. Great. Yeah. Actually, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. There's, um, actually, what happens if size is zero? It goes into an infinite loop, right? Well, almost. Yeah, like really long. Long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what I was going to say is, if you if you call our uh, um, realloc with a zero size, um, it has undefined behavior, starting uh, starting in C twenty three. But probably the realloc that you guys use has all the same problems that the C realloc has. To his argument, which was because I use that value somewhere else, I know that it has to be safe. And then that brings us all the, way, all the way back to the original discussion, which says, I survived doing something else before, which means this is guaranteed to be safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go back to that exact same it's, it's a little bit. It's a little bit. Therefore, this works. It's a little bit similar, but I, I, I it, it, maybe it's an independent point, but my point is zero size is a really, Problematic. It almost never happens yet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like the six cylinder coming in. Right. Is, is there an issue with describing this in a if size doesn't equal zero conditional? No. 
Uh, I mean, an extra branch in that you don't have to take because you are taking it anyway. But if it's worth. But if we're going to use not equal to zero, then the, the, the side the, the side int approach will work, right? No, I mean, so so the signed int approach will fail if the size is, uh, you have half the range. No, but we, we change the condition to not equal to zero, other than larger than, larger or equal to zero. No, it still won't work because it, it you, you to, to make the signed one work, you'd have to write a test to make sure that uh, the size is representable in a sign type. It, that means it's small enough to fit. Or your indices are all up by one, and what you're actually using is index minus one. No, but if you change, but if it becomes a negative number and then you continue subtracting it, then it will go back to a positive number and then downward to zero. Oh, that's the solution he was showing before. Right. That doesn't then want. I, I mean, here, you just... change the condition to be i not equal to zero. I think that will work. Why can't you just use a regular while loop instead of a do while loop? No, the regular while loop is the same as a for loop. Didn't we want to execute when i was zero? Not if you, not if you did while loop at, the, works. at the beginning, like, like he was doing with the do while loop. Yeah, so let me let me try to finish your question. I, I mean, so here, right, if if size um, can't be represented size t, right, it'd be negative value. Right. And so what'll happen is this loop will terminate on the first iteration. So you'll you'll end up with the code not executing for your many, many yeah. elements. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I, mean, I mean, change the, the check condition to be i not equal zero. No, it doesn't help. It'll, it'll be a huge negative value. If the size is too large, it'll, it'll be less than everything. Yeah, you have to make sure the conversion well, will succeed. Be, remember, the definition of s size t is that it's negative 1 to some big, huge number doesn't necessarily have to represent anything other than negative 1. Well, the, the, but the big, huge number is half of size t. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Can you go back to the do all to the do well slide? If you just make that a, a regular while loop, but you decrement it right at the top of the loop, it will work fine. She wants you to pop a while up there where the do is. Yeah. And then decrement before the access? Yeah. Yeah. Did everybody like that? Well, yeah. that's, the, that's the one where all your indices are up by one, higher by one than they should I, be. I tell, you what I, I tell you what I did is I tested no, every one of these examples. <laughs> so, so I. You're right. You decrement the index before you, before you use it, but after you check it. So in the loop, right. yeah, in the loop statement, all your indices are up by one yeah. from what they should be. Right. So when you hit zero, it'll. And then in the square brackets, they are down to what you right. to, to what you invented. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfectly. Yeah. Um, put it in the chat. I'll put it in the next iteration of the slides. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to comment that in the end, we are always good. Um, because <laughs> you're, 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 you're German, just, right? <laughs> container has size, unsigned size max. Then we can't use uns, uh, we can't use a sign type to iterate over it because the container size is too large. Yeah. And if we use a four with with a, an unsigned condition, it will always be true because we we have to go through all unsigned numbers. And all unsigned numbers have to give access to the to the loop. And at the end, we, we wrap around, and then we get at our first element. Well, you're assuming that your address space and your size t space is the same, which no, no, just to, just assume your container has the size unsigned size t max. Well, sure, then you're screwed. But if your yeah. container has unsigned size t max minus <laughs> one, yeah, then we can work. Out. Then we can work with it. Then we can. But but then the loop would still overflow because yeah, the sign is still broken. Yeah, the sign is still overflow. Yeah. Over, over. But it, it won't work for every container size. It's, okay. It simply won't work for every container size. Well, sure, it will fail for just one. Yeah, it will fail for that. One, yeah. For just one. Yeah. Which yeah. actually, if, if you have that big of a container, you have no other memory left on the system. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so besides, besides the laws of physics, yeah, it wouldn't work. <laughs> um, Maybe you have a distributed system where each machine has a part of the container. 
<laughs> well, it's it's more of an address space versus the index space question. So as long as your pointer <coughs> and your size t are the same size, that's it. If you if you are if you had a size like pointer bigger than size t, then you could allocate somewhere else. You could have more space than you can index in one contiguous shot. Unit one twenty eight. <laughs> no, say so, so. Carrying on, and and this is a continuation of let's use signed integers. Uh, another problem with unsigned integers is it's it's kind of common, say, when you're trying to figure out if you're indexing within the bounds of an array uh, to um, subtract the start of the array from the end of the array, and then see whether that's greater than some uh, some margin of safety that you have, maybe maybe zero. Um, so if the programmer fails to eliminate the edge case where uh, the end index is before the start index, right? This check will pass uh, because of wraparound. So the, again, this is another sort of problem with the unsigned. Uh, now, if you have code that guarantees, um, you know, index end indexes, uh, you know, uh, at a higher number, higher value than the start index, then this won't be an issue. Okay, so both unsigned and signed operations can be wrong, okay? There's no, there's no, there's not anything you can do that's guaranteed to be right all the time. Uh, you can always make mistakes. And so the question becomes, you know, uh, which mistakes are gonna be more common? Which ones are gonna have more dire consequences? Which ones are gonna be harder to find? All these sort of things. So when you look at unsigned, uh, again, the problem area here is around zero. Right? It's also around unit max, but it's not really a problem area because we usually don't operate around there. right? But we do operate around zero. So zero is a problem area for unsigned numbers. Uh, with signed numbers, um, it's really safe to operate around zero. right? Uh, the problem areas are beyond int min and beyond int max. And in the sign case, um, you know, those sort of problem areas translate to undefined behavior. Okay, so I have some observations. These are my thoughts on those slides. So my first thought is, and this first thought is why I changed, I added the subtitle to the, the class, right? So. I think a lot of the reasons people suggest signed integers is because they assume programmers are idiots, you know, and that people are writing real sloppy code. They don't understand the idea that digital integers have limited ranges. And so they're not thinking about it. And they'll make this mistake with unsigned types that they don't realize somehow that the unsigned type can't have a negative value. And you get this kind of wraparound stuff. So my point is, we don't want those type of people writing safety critical systems right? if they can't reason about that, right? I mean, that's pretty basic. If they can't reason about unsigned numbers not taking negative values, you know, they're really going to miss uh, the undefined behavior going over size max and under, under size min, right? So the, the argument falls apart, right? So the argument is if you've got people writing bad code, It'll be correct a little bit more of the time because there's less problems around zero with sign types. But so, so that's why the, the title changed, right? If you don't care if your code sucks, sign intertypes maybe are a good approach, <laughs> right? But if you do care about safety and security and correctness, right, unsigned integers are a better choice. The, the final point is, you know, no one gets. No one gets through testing with an infinite loop, right? <laughs> There's no way not to notice that your code, you know, stopped doing anything and the CPU's pegged at 100% and you can't even break the, the process, right? People notice that. <laughs> so, you know, infinite loops aren't really a security problem. You know, if, you, um, if your code doesn't compile, it's not a security problem. It's super secure. You know, the problem is, <laughs> When it does compile and you think, oh, look, I can ship this now, that's when the problem starts. So, so, so the problem is, you know, errors that get through test and gets to deployment. That's, 
<coughs> what creates safety and security problems. Okay, so here's where I pick on uh, uh, Chandler. And of course, he's here at this conference, but it's just too, too afraid to come to my talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I have a question real quick before you get into this part, yeah. because So I assume that uh, your, I'm assuming that this slide, when you're talking about whether you're gonna use integral types, you're talking about for indexing. The thing that concerns me the most um, is buffer overflows, right? Uh, reading or writing uh, to, to, to uh, reading or writing outside the bounds of an object, valid object. And, and the way you get that to happen typically is you take an integer and you add it to a pointer and then you dereference that and you either read or write memory. And so that integer, right, if, if you don't, if you've lost control of that integer, if you don't know what value that integer has, okay, you can have no confidence when you're dereferencing that expression that it's going to be in bounds. So that's the thing, you know, that worries me the most. So it comes to integers that are used to represent sizes, bounds, you know, loop termination conditions, memory allocations. These are all the things that contribute to buffer overflows. But go ahead. Yeah, no, so oh, that was the answer. So, yeah, so basically indexing into some <coughs> array of something, that's the integer. You're Indexes, size, integer. bounds, lengths. So, so on your for loop, then, if you're, if you're concerned about that, so to me, I would say that the, if you're just talking about from a safety, and I'm not in a safety critical industry, but I'm in a, if your code doesn't work right, then it's unsafe. Right, so either either one of these conditions, if you if you overflow either one of the bounds of a signed integer, then you're in UV land. Mm. But if you wrap when you don't expect to, you're still in unexpected behavior land from at least your your program. Your yeah, program. Wrap, so wrapping wrapping. Both is, of those are going to be wrong. Wrapping is generally bad, right? But but this like this use case that's used to argue for signed integers, where you, you know. Uh, they don't understand the number can't get less than zero and you get an infinite loop, that's not gonna... Yeah, so, so in that case, why not just use a pointer and increment the pointer by one? Well, I do that. You're not going, you're not going to have either one of these situations happen. Uh, I'd have to think about that. I mean, if the, if the bounds, if, if, the, if the for loop expression, if your loop logic is wrong, your pointer can still go off past the bounds. Well, that's true for any loop. Yeah. yeah. If the loop logic is, is wrong. wrong. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a. You, 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 got a, you got a much better. You got a much better case of four p equals whatever blah 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 plus plus p, and now you don't. You're not doing anything. You're not doing any indexing. You're not changing your i. You just have a pointer to what you're looking at. And just, that's, the, that's the iterator model where you, you don't correct. use less than you use it. Correct. Yeah, but he's talking like from a C land, right? Well, so. the pointers are iterated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll think about that a bit more. I mean, the idea of incrementing pointers doesn't doesn't scare me, obviously, right? Because I'm from C land. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, well, that's the basic model that most C++ people are going to use because most of C++ people are used to this iterator model where you grab some reference to something, then you just increment through it, whether it's through a library facility or by yourself anyway. You're not really dealing with those indexes. Yeah. But you still have to get the termination condition right. You still need to know. It's, it's equal to the end. What's the last What's the last part of it? Right? How do you say it's a string? How do you know where the end is? What, well, the oh, string oh, oh, so you're, oh, so you still want to use non-terminating strings. OK, I see. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. That was, that was unfair. Um, no, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, if you're if you're if you're actually iterating through strings, and you should be using string algorithms, you shouldn't be doing that by yourself. Okay. Well, string view begin and gives you the pair of pointers. Sure does. Yeah. Yeah, so and you so you erase through a string by calling begin and on the string view, and so, so, yeah. so, somewhere in here, there's going to be a point that says, you know. Don't use integers. You know, use use indexes. Use these iterators. Use these mechanisms. The well, I, I, think, I think I'm going farther than what you had said, and I'm saying, yeah, don't use the don't use don't use an integral type to iterate through something when you've got a use a pointer. I, I I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, I'll I'll give it a little bit more thought, and you know, probably add a slide next time I, I give the talk. I think there are cases though where you do need an integer 
type. Like th there are cases where you're not just using it to index, you're using it to index and also using it for something else. Or maybe you have two arrays that are at the same length and you need to index into both of them. Yeah, yes. and that's an unfortunate, unfortunate, uh, that's an unfortunate problem trying to iterate through two things with the same index. Trying to yeah, them. that's where like the for loops, like I mean the for colon loops fall apart. Uh, where you, you basically the only reason you need an iterator or or, or an index is uh, for coordinated access. Okay, but so, should get the zip view, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's get back to picking on Chandler because this would. This it might be my favorite part. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, so, so my story is about a year and a half ago. Uh, John Heed, who's our the C editor and also active in C plus plus, he brought us a paper on uh, bit operations that come from C plus plus, and we looked and it used a lot of sign types. And the C committee looked at that and say, okay, well, you're you're trying to say which bit. The possible answers are zero through sixty four. Why are they using a sign type? And so after a while, we changed it to unsigned type. Uh, and that's what's being standardized now. Uh, and you know, I was puzzled. Like, like I said, I've asked this question. And then so eventually someone told me, you know why C++ is using sign types? It's because of this presentation that Chandler gave at CPPCon in 2016 and sent me a link. So I watched the presentation. And what uh, Chandler said was, if you take this piece of code, which is part of the spec benchmarks, so it's something that um, compiler writers have a lot of experience with, and uh, notice in this code that this, this part of the logic repeats many, many times, right? Because if it didn't repeat, uh, well, the, these things would be dead code that'd be optimized out and stuff. So it's going to keep going. And so Chandler said, um, if you use uh, signed integers, this will be faster. And so his argument was, OK, <coughs> we're passing in uint32t, unsigned 32-bit integer. This is an addressing operation, so it's going to be a 64-bit operation. These operations here are 32-bit operations and required to take place in 32-bit. And because they're unsigned, you have to get the correct wraparound behavior. And so Chandler argued that um, you know, you've got to do the same operation twice, once in 64 bits and once in 32 bits with wraparound. And therefore, uh, unsigned integers would be slower than signed integers. So what I did was I tested it. <laughs> and um, so it turns out. On a 64-bit architecture, if you pass in as parameters uh, for i1 and i2, if you declare these to be size t, you get um, the best performance at 03 on GCC, ICC, and Clang. All three compilers produce the best performance for size t type, the 64-bit unsigned type. So, you know, to my thinking, it's like, you know, hey, you use the correct type, and it's faster. How shocking is that? <laughs> um, so the int 32t and the uint 32t uh, was basically compiler dependent. Some compilers signed int was faster, some unsigned was faster. But in all cases, it was always slower than size t, which is, uh, you know, in my mind, the correct type to use here. Um, so. So I asked Chandler on Twitter, and his response was, uh, just to be clear, this is an old talk. Compilers have changed a lot. Um, this is also brittle. In retrospect, I should have had a better example. Uh, the idea was never to introduce UB, but that got lost. I largely don't think the point I was hoping to make came across, and I really wish people would stop citing this talk. Okay. So I think he's trying to walk it back, is my takeaway from that, that Twitter discussion. He's not standing behind this any longer. OK, so you know, I have a similar example in my book, but the, the, the benchmark there shows that 64-bit is the fastest. On most compilers, 32-bit signed int will actually generate exact same machine code. 
<coughs> okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, I have unsigned, a link to the... 32-bit unsigned int is the slow one, because that one has to do LA. Okay. Yeah, uh, we can change... We LA, can... The, 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 the uh, LA load extend address. Uh, that's the instruction that does the 32-bit wraparound, because native 64-bit wraparound happens in hardware. It's just as fast as not doing it. Well, I think that, I think that was his whole point during the That was his whole point. That, was that if you use a 32-bit unsigned value for 64-bit That was half of his point. point. The other half was the 64-bit part, which didn't age well, because in, in reality, like at least today on all compilers, using 32-bit int, signed int, the compiler will just emit 64-bit add, because it can, because if it overflows, the compiler says, I don't care what happens, I'm going to use 64-bit add, and you just have <coughs> a 33rd-bit skill, which is as valid as anything else. And if it doesn't happen, then you can't tell the difference which add I use. Okay. So, um, you know, to continue, so, so my, my view of this, I, I, I think, sometimes it's hard to tell, I think most of you with it, uh, with the same view, um, that, you know, the un unsigned types are, are more useful in general. Uh, they shouldn't just be limited to modular behavior. And so I kind of wondered why Chandler, who's a very smart guy, and a lot of other smart people, all ha kind of have this view of signed, uh, integers being better, and then I found uh, found this talk, and uh, in this talk in 2013, and 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 beyond a, uh, I was at SD best practices back in 2006 in Boston, and his book had just come out, and it was 1,700 pages long, and in page 1,482, he said just use signed int for everything. And so I asked people, I said, why do you say that? And he said, well, he only has so much room in the book to talk about stuff, so that's a simplifying assumption, right? But, but he really doubles down on that in this talk. And in this talk, he makes three arguments. He says, um, a lot of errors occur from mixing signed and unsigned types. So I completely agree with that. And then the second thing he says is that uh, I'm going to say this two ways, okay? I'm going to say the, the thing he didn't quite say. <laughs> so the second thing he didn't quite say was um, signed types are unsigned. Size types are unsigned. What he said was, unfortunately, <laughs> signed types are unsized, right? And then his third statement was, that's why you should use signed integers for everything, right? And to me, that third statement is where the logic broke. Right? Because he's saying there's a problem mixing signed and unsigned. Everyone agrees with that. Right? The second point is that size types are unsigned. I mean, how could you disagree with that? It's, they are. Okay? But now that you've got this constraint that size types are unsigned and they can't be changed, the, the next logical conclusion has to be also use unsigned types for your sizes, but instead he says use sign types, which to me is where the, the logic breaks down. So this results in things like this Google C++ style guide, uh, which is, uh, okay, so this is all verbatim uh, from the style guide. So the first thing it says, unsigned integers are good for representing bit fields in modular arithmetic. Yes, I agree with that, they are good for that. Next he says, because of a historical accident, um, C++ uses unsigned integers to represent the size of containers. Okay, not an accident. <laughs> right. We went through that. There's a lot of pe smart people working on that for a long time, all agreed it should be unsigned. <sighs> the fact that unsigned arithmetic doesn't model the behavior of a simple integer, but instead is defined by the standard to model modular arithmetic wrapping on overflow and underflow means a significant class of bugs cannot be diagnosed by the compiler. So what he's saying here, okay, is, and we've kind of had this discussion a little bit, what he's saying here is 
it's better to use signed integers because they have undefined behavior <laughs> when they overflow. So it's better to have bugs in your code that we can go and find rather than unsigned integer wraparound that we can't find. Now that's 100% bullshit, right? <laughs> I mean, and so the first reason that's bullshit is you can find uns unsigned integer wraparound. Nobody's stopping you. The fact that it's well-defined doesn't mean you can't use UB sanitizer and the flag I showed you to detect it and report it, and you should, okay? There are a lot of compilers that in the default mode aren't standard conforming, <laughs> you know? Um, they'll do things with unsigned they shouldn't do. They'll assume they don't wrap around. Um, so you can absolutely, you know, um, find unsigned integer wraparound. The other thing, you know, I, I probably said this a few times, but it boggles my mind that intelligent people can say, insert a bunch of UB into your code to improve the safety and security of your system, <laughs> right? It just seems so absurd. It's, it's, it just seems impossible that people can say that and, you know, not, not be told, uh, oh, that sounds great, Grandpa, maybe it's past your bedtime, you know? <laughs> um, okay, so in other cases, the defined behavior impedes optimization. So again, if you code correctly, <laughs> the code has to execute. But hey, if you code incorrectly, then we can remove all the incorrect code and it'll be faster. And, and, and hopefully it'll be what you originally should have written. Oh, that's entirely true. I can make your code run as fast as you want if I it doesn't need to, to be correct. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that, but, but, but that's so, entirely so we, the point, because they're not saying uh, write your code incorrect so it's faster. They're saying uh, you, you may have a case which in your program is defined as UB. Right? These inputs, I reject. They're not, they, they are UB. And within that contract, I, assuming that these inputs will not happen, I will run faster. Okay, so I think we've we've had we you know done that one already, so I don't want to rehash it again. Um, okay, continuing. Uh, that said, and here's you know beyond again from the from the presentation, mixing signings of intertypes is responsible for a large class of problems. Hundred percent agree. Uh, use iterators and containers rather than pointers and sizes. Um, okay, so I, I agree with that. You know, this gentleman was saying pointers might not be so bad. I had to think about that a bit more. But yeah, you know, stay away from the integers. Uh, it shocks me. You know, I've been talking about integers a long time. And the reason is because they're ubiquitous and nobody understands them, right? It's a bad combination. Um, and then do not use an unsigned type merely to assert that a variable is non-negative. And actually 100% in the people in the room disagree with this point. So this is in the Google C++ style guide. Google's a good company, so a lot of smart people. People believe this shit, right? Saying things like this is almost negligent, you know? Um, we had a panel last night about safety and security. You know, shit like this is not making things better. This is making things a lot, lot worse. Things are getting worse. Um, so, you know, they really have to delete this, if not retract it and say the opposite. That's my opinion. Um, we said we've got, you know, UB sanitizer, and I have five minutes. Um, so I might finish the first topic. <laughs> so, so many vulnerabilities are discovered using UB sand and fuzzing. Again, I mentioned this sanitize sign integer overflow. I'm not crazy about the name. <laughs> uh, wait, sanitize sign integer overflow. Okay, I'm fine with that name. That diagnosis sign integer overflow. Uh, there's also, um, you know, unsigned uh, integer overflow. That's the name I'm not crazy about. It should be unsigned integer wraparound. But you can see here that you can set this flag, and the compiler will instrument your code. Uh, with a, a call to the you know overflow handler, and you'll get the wraparound diagnose at runtime. So clearly the bit about 
We can't diagnose that as a lie, right? There it is. It's being diagnosed. Um, what they mean is they can't diagnose the intentional use because you're allowed. You're allowed to use it. The, what they, the compiler can't tell if you meant it or it's an accident. Yeah, because it's well defined by the language. Oh, so but if you, you meant it, you can surround your code with like pragma disabled with warning and all of that. Right. Pro, yeah, that's what you would have to do. If they, yes. If, if, so right. Say, well, that's absolutely. Yeah. That seems to be maybe a good idea. That's probably. Good. I mean, you said it was a good idea, and he said yeah. probably a good idea. That's like, <laughs> that's the best I'm doing with you guys. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, signed integers are the same or worse than unsigned for division and remainder. And so what I mean by that is here are all the operations that can wrap around, and you'll notice that uh, division and remainder cannot. So here are all the operations that can overflow, and you'll notice that division and remainder can. Uh, so it's sometimes not well understood. Um, so so for, on x86, for example, uh, if you take a 32-bit or 64-bit integer and divide it by 1, uh, you get an overflow uh, that uses the iDiv instruction. It doesn't set the overflow flag. Instead, it causes a division error. Um, if either you have divide by zero or you've got overflow, right? The quotient can't be represented. So a divide error results in a fault on interrupt vector zero. So basically, uh, integer overflow on division on uh, x86 uh, processors traps. So a lot of people don't realize that remainder can also trap. So um, for remainder, uh, so, so this, this percent operator, it's not a modulo operator, it's a remainder operator. There, there's actually, in the index, uh, it's the only place it said remainder. You can't find the word remainder uh, in the text of the standard. But um, So if I say int min remainder minus 1, on many CPUs like uh, um, x86, that's implemented using an iDiv instruction. Right. So even though the mathematical result of that is zero, uh, when you execute the iDiv instruction, it's going to say the result isn't representable and it's going to uh, cause a division error. So you get a fault. Okay. So uh, it's easier and faster to check for unsigned wraparound than signed overflow. I didn't bring my examples for that, but it's pretty it's pretty intuitively obvious. Uh, you know. Uh, it's like five lines of code versus 20 lines of code. So this slide, well, the next, this slide and the next slide kind of wrap it up. So then I'll be, I'll, I'll be done. Um, so again, you know, whatever you pick, there can be problems. And people can point to it and say there will be problems. And they are right. right? Uh, there's nothing that is a silver bullet. Uh, signed integers have a lot more ways to fail than unsigned integers. There's more things that can go wrong. Uh, injecting UB into a program uh, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and finally, if you want to program safely and securely, if you want to always know that your result is correct, it's, it's, it's less expensive to do that with unsigned. There's less code that has to be written. There's less te tests that have to be execute it to you know, make sure that your values are correct because there are less things that can go wrong. So uh, yeah, uh, again, I think there's this kind of common misconception floating around the standards committee. Uh, there's not too much of it here uh, that I've seen. So then I've got a thing on exact width types, but obviously we're not going to do that. So any last questions? Do you have do you have any in, or thoughts about the changes to say that everything is too powerful now? Um, you know, I, I think it's a smart. It makes everything a lot easier. It makes it more defined, so there's less variability. I think you know. I think there'd be a lot of engineers who would be really shocked to watch their program run on a once-complement machine. <laughs> you know, and see what happened to it. 
so, you know, I, I think it's a good direction. You know, we were, I was in the C committee uh, back in C11, and someone said, should we make, should we only support choose complement? And then someone else said, who's gonna talk to the ven that vendor? And then everyone looked at their shoes, and then we moved on. <laughs> and we kept support for one's complement. And then, you know, a few years ago, we had the discussion again, and we, uh, we went after it a bit more. And it, the vendors burrowed, by the way. Uh, and people were like, you know, it looks like they're emulating it. <laughs> They don't do it for real anymore. And so we had a younger group of people and they pulled the trigger on it finally. You know, there's some things I think are never gonna happen and then they happen. And it's same thing happened with uh, Get S. I never thought that would go away and someone pulled it off. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah I mean, it feels like this choice between size and assign for sizes Choosing between two not so great options. And What's the third option? <laughs> it's like voting for president, right? <laughs> so it feels like we need a different type, something like a positive, non-negative integer, which is well from the name non-negative, but which doesn't work wrong, and on subtraction it can produce a sign. You could use maybe a big integer, you know, infinite precision integer. That eliminates these problems. It's heavy. It's expensive. There's a proposal for saturation arithmetics. That saturation? Like, yeah. That if you, if you would normally overflow wrap around, you just stay at the maximum value. Uh, which for some cases, that might be a solution. It really depends on the use case, but it's not going to be UV and it's like kind of easy to reason about. And that, well, some use cases people use it's that. It's not going to be UV by itself, but the infinite loops that it will create are going yeah, to Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, it's for certain use cases, but there, there is a proposal somewhere to, to add that. Any last so, question? Also expensive. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate Thank you. you.